Today's guest is Philip de Corte. If you don't know who Philip de Corte is, he is head of IP crop protection at Syngenta and also he was opponent against an European patent. And uh, in the appeal proceedings, um, the board, the enlarged board of appeal uh, was given questions and this resulted in the decision G2 of 21 um, of the enlarged board of appeal that was rendered on 23rd of March 2023. And Philip, you were part of, um, you were the opponent, opponent and the appellant. Um, maybe you can briefly summarize this decision. Yes, I can summarize the decision um, by saying that the patent was actually upheld, uh, to, to a bit to my uh, surprise, I must say. Um, and um, I think it would be worthwhile going through the oral uh, procedure uh, and, and explaining a little bit what happened. So for people who, uh, for the audience, maybe it's useful to just remind them what is this about? This is a patent uh, that is referring to a mixture of two, two known pesticides. And the inventive, alleged inventive uh, step is based upon a technical effect called synergy. Yeah, so two known insecticides, when you use them together, it gives a effect that is more than the um, calculated effect. Now, um, what had happened is we had filed an opposition um, against that the patent, and we had submitted data showing that the very few data points that the patentee had used to base their uh, technical effect upon were actually, I would not say wrong, but we could show by much more data that the conclusion that there would be synergistic effect was not correct. So there were single points, uh, data points about two uh, respective insects, and we showed with much more data that actually the conclusion that there could be a synergy was not correct. So then we ended up in the situation where the patentee said, well, here we want to base our invention upon yet another uh, synergistic effect for another insecticide. Would we, and they wanted to uh, submit further data in that case to prove that there was a synergistic effect against the third insect. So that's where then the Board of Appeal said, hmm, now we need to go to the enlarged Board of Appeal um, because it's not clear to us whether this third technical effect was actually already, hmm, I'll use the word disclosed for lack of a better word, was already disclosed in the initial application. And they referred to two uh, strains of case law. They said, well, well, it, it was a little bit more complicated than that, but I'm, I'm trying to summarize. They referred to two, in their view, two contradictory strains of case law. And that this is the famous up initio plausibility case law and the up initio implausibility uh, case law. Just a small word about what that means. Up initio plausibility means that when uh, a person skilled in the art would look at the application, would he find it plausible that the new technical effect that is now claimed in this case, that that would have been in that encompassed in that in invention. The up initio implausibility on the other hand says, well, Anything that is not implausible probably is plausible, and you can submit data. So the one, the up initio plausibility, is a higher standard than the up initio implausibility. So they referred a quite a complicated uh, question because the Board of Appeal had linked it to the free assessment of, of uh, information can, uh, and um so the, the question was relatively complex, but the board, the enlarged board of appeal said, okay, I'm not, we're not going to reformulate the cases. We, and we do not really like this difference between, or this distinction between up initio plausibility and up initio implausibility. Although just as an aside, this has been used in many national case laws, case law uh, cases, but 
So they said, well, we don't really like this whole concept of plausibility or implausibility. We are going to define a new standard. And they seem to suggest, at least in my opinion, something in between. I said, well, it's not really up in your plausibility. It's not really implausibility. So it's something in between. And they actually set the, um, the, the, they set a new standard. And I'm going to read the order number two. It said, a patent applicant or proprietor may rely on a upon a technical effect for inventive step if the skilled person, having the common general knowledge in mind, and based on the application as originally filed, would derive set as effect as being encompassed by the technical teaching and embodied by the same originally disclosed invention. So when I read that, I said, well, yeah, I see that. It's, it's, I, I, in the previous interview that I had with you, I, I called it, uh, 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 or I compared it to a pronunciation of the Oracle of Delphi, I believe, saying, well, everybody will read in this, in this uh, uh, statement what they themselves want to read into it. But nevertheless, I thought it was not completely meaningless. That was also the, but on the other hand, when we went to the oral proceedings, we clearly had the impression, well, with not only the impression, the Board of Appeal themselves said that for them, this uh, decision, this order of the enlarged Board of Appeal was absolutely not clear. Uh, they did not really, they did not really feel how uh, very good, how to apply this encompassed by and embodied by. So, it was a, a long discussion, um, which then ended up in uh, without much clarity for the patentee or for the uh, for us, the opponent. But they came to the conclusion that in the end, indeed, the uh, applicant could rely upon the data that uh, they wanted to submit, so that they could submit it and they could rely upon it. So, of course, we were a bit surprised because you would have thought that. Uh, the, the the referral itself should have been based upon a certain doubt that they had whether the this invention, this new invention, was actually disclosed in the original, disclosed and embodied, to use the enlarged Board of Appeals uh, wording, in the original application. And um, it seemed odd to me that a uh, the new order could be interpreted as almost as low as the up initio implausibility. Uh, reason for my, 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 so it's not only me, I think, that, that finds that odd, because we were referring to a court of appeal decision in the UK, in, the, in, in England, the courts of England, the court of appeal uh, of England, where um, Justice Arnold had actually given his interpretation in the meantime of G2 of 21, and he said, well, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, well, it's not completely clear, but it seems to me that it is closer to up initio plausibility than to up initio implausibility. So I, I had the same feeling that it was actually a standard which comes closer to up initio plausibility than implausibility. But uh, after a, yeah, a long day, because it actually started at uh, a little bit after nine, and we were done by 5.30 in the evening. So it was a long session with the Board of Appeal. Uh, they simply came to the conclusion that indeed the the uh, the uh, patentee could, could rely upon the data that he submitted and indeed get an inventive step. So it's, it's a long story. I, I think I felt a bit frustrated because, again, referring to our previous um, interview, I had mentioned then already, I was more or less agnostic about the outcome. I had said, well, I would prefer that we can um, uh, that we can win the opposition and that we can uh, revoke or actually partly revoke the, 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 the patent. But what I want much more is is guidance. What, what is it now? Can we now use this? Uh, can we now use this case? To, to get a bit of sharper scalpel to, to, to make the surgery, or do we still use a sort of blunt uh, hammer almost to, to, uh, to decide on whether um, new data and, 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 a, and a new invention can be allowed to be the basis of a patent. So um, that's where we, that, where we ended up. Of course, 
I, again, I'm saying this without any uh, knowledge of the reasons. We're looking forward to, to, to the reasons, obviously. Maybe the reasons we will clarify it. But um, as, as it stands, the patent is upheld. And uh, at least from the oral proceedings itself, I don't think we became much wiser. So you can't really, um, at the moment, you don't really have a clear idea why the Board of Appeal interpreted the G2 20, of 21 in this way. And you can't really think of the, the reasons they would give, right? If I understand you correctly. Well, I think they really, really struggled with, with the interpretation because at some point the uh, one member of the Board of Appeal asked, well, is, is it, the, the, the order seems to set up two separate questions. Question one is, is it, in, is it encompassed? Question two is, is it embodied? And he seemed to suggest that he said, well, maybe the large Board of Appeal uh, gave this order to gave to give a sort of general order but maybe you do not always need to apply the two questions um uh to every case and so maybe the embodiment question is something that should not be applied to this case we of course disagreed i said well of course it needs to be applied in this case um so so indeed it is strange that Again, it's, it seems almost illogical the, to us, the decision, because if they had so much um, if they had so much doubt about the initial application, well, I would have been surprised that um, that they if, if they would have been more certain, let me put it that put this way, if they would have been more certain about the application as filed, then I don't think that that would have, been could have been the basis for a referral to the enlarged board of appeal so they must have had substantial doubt in their mind whether this was okay or not now obviously they could say well we read this order as a confirmation as the up initial implausibility which they seem to have hinted at in their preliminary uh, opinion although they didn't say it with that many words but maybe that is what they what they have uh what how they they thought maybe it, for them this is up in its implausibility but again it is not really quite clear to us actually it is also not really clear guidance for future cases uh, so maybe no, other sorry, boards of you... appeal need to interpret g2 of 21 in different ways to find yeah. Well, yes, you're right. The the I am. Um, we'll have to see again the reasons because, of course, with the reasons, maybe things become a bit clearer. But um, I think the enlarged board of appeal did their best to come up with a meaningful um, statement. It could have been clearer. I, I I think many people will agree with that. But okay, they did try. And it is then, of course, uh, the duty of the rest of the of the system, if I may use that word, to give it more meaning. And and I think uh, this case has not really brought that much more insight. And I'm afraid that if indeed this um, this issue uh, is continues to 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 fester, because it, as you saw from the Amicus Curiae letters. Uh, or briefs, there is a there is actually a, a fundamental problem that needs to be addressed in in one way or another. Uh, th th that's a different matter. I mean, you might have people have different opinion on how it needs to be addressed, but that it needs to be addressed is 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 I think uh, uh, really a, a a a fact. So it would be a shame that we cannot use this now to to. Um, to uh, get more clarity in this in this area of case law. Yeah, too sad. Um, yeah. Any final words? What uh, EP practitioner, EPO practitioners can learn from this decision of the Board of Appeal? Well, if I'm cynical, um, it is that indeed uh, the 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 what. If I'm cynical at this moment, uh, <laughs> you could argue: look, actually, you don't have to. Uh, disclose 
too much. You don't have to, to have too much data, too much support for your inventive step in your uh, application. You will probably um, get it through the uh, through the uh, European Patents uh, uh, Office prosecution. The problem will be how will national courts then look at it? Because that is actually where then you run amok. Huh? If if the uh, European Patent Office grants patents, which 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 is fine as long as they are uh, quality patents, um, and then they these patents come into into use where you should really start using them, and then they they seem they appear to be not so valid as you originally thought. That is really an, an, an issue that that uh, that needs addressing, um, and uh, well. We'll see maybe in the in the reasons we'll we'll see you somewhat uh, clearer in in what the the thinking was and maybe that gives more guidance. But again, for the moment, I would say well, um, if you have some a little inkling of of support, uh, go for it. Right, you can always file more support later, even in opposition Correct. proceedings. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Right. That's that's for the moment the the, the decision. All right. Well, thank you very much, Philippe, for being on uh, in my video. And thank we you. will see how the grounds will be um, worded. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank All you right. very, very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank bye. You. bye. bye.